up next on Walking by Faith. The Spirit of God has grace for you to help you in every situation for every need whether it has to do with your job, your finances, your family, with relationships, with your health, with your money. It doesn't matter. He said that he has grace for every need, appropriate help, well-timed help, coming just when we need it. Hello, I want to welcome you to Walking by Faith. I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Now we're talking about destiny, fight for it. The apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight. You know, the good fight is the fight of faith. Now the Bible says this, it says that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. When we stay in faith, we are always going to have victory. And I want to talk to you today about your destiny, and about staying in faith, believing God to fulfill your purpose, God's plan, God's destiny for your life. Some of us don't even realize God has a plan in a destiny. But the Bible says in Ephesians 2 and verse 10 that He has prepared good works for us to do beforehand, to take paths He's prepared ahead of time. God has a promised land for you. He had a promised land for the children of Israel, a place of victory, a place of abundance. And God has that same place for you, a place where there's victory, where there's peace, where there's joy, where there's purpose, where there is abundance. And we're gonna talk about how you and I can walk in what God has for us. Thank you for being with us. And let's join this message right now as it begins. We're in a series of messages, destiny, fight for it. Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven, the Apostle Paul writes, I have fought the good fight. In the Christian life, you're always in a fight. And the truth is, everybody is fighting a great battle. Everybody. You fight the good fight. He said, I finished the, the race. I've kept the faith. Now, there's a progression. You fight the good fight. You stay in the race. And you keep the faith. What the devil tries to do is, first of all, to get you to quit the fight. Just say one day, I'm, I'm going to quit resisting. I'm just going to go with my friends. I'm just going to do what they do. I'm going with culture. I'm not, I'm not going to resist that anymore. He gets you to quit the fight. And after you quit the fight, his next thing is to get you to drop out of the race tomorrow. And to just say, you know, I'm just, I'm just not going to apply myself at all. I'm just going to sit back. And once you do, ultimately what happens is you abandon the faith. That's someplace in the future. But that's what happens. That's why we never quit the fight. You never drop out of the race. And you never abandon the faith. Now, I, I know how we feel when things are good. right? When things are good and things are up, we're like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Everything's so good. And, and it's kind of like Jesus and I, we're buds. You know, we, we got it going on. I can feel his presence. But when things are not so good, when things are down, when you feel underneath, like you, you, you feel like you're in a free fall, right? in those times, we tend to think that God is distant, that, that God is a spectator. But this is what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And underneath are the everlasting arms. The Hebrew word underneath literally means the bottom. So when you go down to the deepest, darkest, most depressing, discouraging, when you are so full of despair and sorrow, when there's trouble, when you feel you cannot go any deeper, the Bible says underneath. When you're down on the bottom, underneath are God's everlasting arms. And he is not there as an observer. He is there as a rescuer. He's there to provide help. He is there to comfort. The Bible says about Jesus that he is the author and the finisher of your faith. In other words, our faith begins with Jesus, but Jesus personally works with you to make sure that your faith keeps on going, keeps on growing. You know, the Bible says you go from faith to faith. 
The faith we begin with is awesome, but for us to fulfill our purpose and our destiny, our faith needs to grow. We go from faith to faith. The Bible says you go from glory to glory, right? And it takes a new faith to get you to that next place of glory. So God is your helper, your rescuer, your comfort, your deliverer, and he is the author, but he is the finisher of your faith. In Psalms 139, David said, if I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my head bed in hell, behold, you are there. And if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will uphold me. Remember, David wrote, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When you're down, when you're facing the problems, the situations, when you're in despair, at that point, God says, I will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. David said, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And that anointing is God's grace that enables us to do what we could not do without God's help. It's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It says this, let us then fearlessly, confidently, boldly draw near to the throne of grace the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures. I've talked about this before, but we'll say this again. God has mercy for you, but he also has grace for you. Mercy is for your failures, your sins, and your shortcomings. Mercy covers your past, but grace covers you today and tomorrow. And grace, listen, this is what grace is. To find grace, to help, to find grace to help in good time for every need. The Spirit of God has grace for you to help you in every situation for every need, whether it has to do with your job, your finances, your family, with relationships, with your health, with your money. It doesn't matter. He said that he has grace for every need, appropriate help, well-timed help coming just when we need it. So we've got mercy for our failures, but there is grace for today, for your time of trouble, when he prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies and anoints your head with oil. He supernaturally equips you to do what you need to do. You may feel like you're in a free fall. You're ruined financially. Your family's torn apart. You've lost your best friend. You've lost your job. Life doesn't seem worth living. But when that happens, the Bible says that right at the bottom, God puts his everlasting arms under you to rescue you, to deliver you, to help you. He is a God that is present in times of trouble. He takes you from faith to faith. Now, it's in Numbers chapter 24. Excuse me. Numbers 14, verse 24, that it talks about Joshua and Caleb. And God said, my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has wholly followed me, I will bring into the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. Now, there are two million Israelites that come to the edge of the promised land. Moses sends in 12 spies. Ten come back and said, boy, the land is beautiful like God said, but seven nations iron chariots, walled cities, giants. We cannot go in. And here's what's interesting. Two stood up and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome. Everybody believes the bad report. How many of you know we live in a negative world? Two million people believe the 10 spies and not one person believed the two positive spies. Everybody just went negative, right? Well, what happened as a result? Those that believed, the two, end up going in. And everybody else died in the desert. Everybody got what they believed. And I think that's very, very important. Ultimately, in the kingdom of God, you get what you believe. Now, God said they had a different spirit. The Bible tells us what that spirit is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10. Excuse me, it's chapter 4, verse 13. It says, we have the same, the identical spirit of faith. The spirit that they had was a spirit of faith. And the most important prayer that you can ever pray is this. It is not that you have the best financial year you ever had in 19, 2016. It is not 
that, oh God, may this year have no problems and God may have no troubles all year in Jesus' name. That is not the most important prayer. The most important prayer that you can pray is that your faith fail not. Jesus said this to Peter. He said, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. And when you sift wheat, you just have shredded wheat left. And that's what the devil wants to do. He wants to reduce you to shredded wheat, right? But Jesus said, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. That your faith fail not. That is the most important thing you can pray. Because faith is a million times more important than money. It's more important than happiness. It's more important than a family vacation or family time. It's more important than your house or your career or your job or your retirement funds. Faith connects you with God. Faith pleases God. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. All right. It is by faith you connect with God. You receive from God. You please God by faith. And there is no other way. Now, Caleb, God said, he had a different spirit. He had the spirit of faith. 45 years later, after they, they came back with that good report, two million people have died in the desert. The children of Israel have crossed over into the promised land. For five years, there's been war. And they have conquered nation after nation, city-state after city-state, 31 kings. And the day comes when they're dividing the land. <clears throat> and the Bible tells us that Joshua is casting lots. Now, I don't know if they had sticks, but in my mind, they've always had dice, right? And he's rolling the dice. Come seven, come 11. He's out there. I want that piece, you know. Oh, man, may I get the right piece. And all the Israel, all the leaders are there. And from the back of the crowd, an old man walks through. Gray hair, long old beard. Head up, shoulders back. People make way. He comes right up and stands in front of Joshua as he's casting lots. And he said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. It's Caleb speaking. Nevertheless, my brother who went up bid me, with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children forever because you wholly followed the Lord your God and because you have wholly followed the Lord your God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am today, 85 years old. Yet I am as strong this day as on the day when Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke to me on that day. For you heard in that day how the Amalekan, the giants were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I'll be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. And Joshua blessed Caleb and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. And Caleb, went, now he's 85, and they're passing stuff out with casting lots. And he said, stop that stuff. He said, nobody's casting lots. I don't care what the lots say. I don't care what you think is coming my way. God made me a promise. And God said through Moses that I can have Hebron. I can have that mountain where the giants are. And that's what I claim is my inheritance. Put your dice away because I'm going to have what God said I can have. And you can take what the world passes your way. And you can take what circumstances bring your way. Or you can have what God said you can have. Because you can have what he said you can have. And you are who he says he, you are. And you can do what God says you can do if you will believe it. But they say it's impossible. That's why Jesus said all things are possible to him who believes. Anything God promised you in his word, you can have it. But you've got to have the same attitude that Caleb had. You've got to have the spirit of faith. And I'm not taking what falls my way. I'm taking what I believe God has promised me. And if I believe it, I'm going to receive it. 
Now, he didn't go up there and the giant say, oh, Caleb's coming. Let's run. How many know he had to fight? He had to stand. He had to resist. He had to displace the enemy. But he did. Remember this, the most important thing in your life is your faith. It brings salvation. It brings forgiveness. It brings peace with God, redemption, rewards, blessing, favor, supernatural help, appropriate help for every need. That's what the Bible says, right? And faith sees different than other people. Faith sees through the lens of God's promises. Ten spies just looked, and this is what they saw. They saw with their eyes, in a sense, but they saw through their eyes, they saw with their heart. Caleb had eyes, but he didn't see with his eyes, he saw with his heart. And his heart was full of a spirit of faith. And when you have that spirit of faith, you can look at a situation and other people see the exact same situation and see defeat. But when you have the spirit of faith, you see victory. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Those 10 people, they saw giants. But what Joshua and Caleb saw, they saw the grapes. They saw the pomegranates. They saw that fertile land. They saw the abundance that God said was theirs. And Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome. I was thinking about Roger Bannister again this week. Now, Roger Bannister is, is, is attempting to, to break the four-minute mile. Now, there's people telling you it is humanly impossible. He goes to the 1952 Olympics. He doesn't even place. And people said, you give up. And he says, no, I can do this. I can do this. I mean, different people are trying. For, for, for a millennium, excuse me, for, for a century, people have been trying to break the four-minute mile. Nobody's come very close. Right? They're trying different strategies. One man is drinking cheetah milk because cheetahs are the fastest mammals on earth. They can run 70 miles an hour. He thought, man, I drink some cheetah milk. I'm going to get faster. When I read that, I thought, who milked that cheetah? Because I don't know who did that, but man, I, I would not have any part of milking that cheetah. I'm telling you, all right? But they're people, they're desperate. They're trying, they're trying, all right? So, so you know the story, May 6, 1954, all right? Two years after he'd been to the Olympics, he breaks the four-minute mile. He runs a three-minute, 59-second, and four-tenths mile. Now, here's what's interesting. In a matter of 46 days, that record is broken. And then it's broken again, and it's broken again, and it's broken again, and it's broken again, and it's broken again. And by 1965, high school seniors are breaking the four-minute mile. But for years, people are trying. Nobody can do it. You say, why? Because they were told it was impossible. See, when you believe something is impossible, it is for you. It is for you. But that's why Jesus said that all things are possible to him who believes. Now you understand, when Jesus said that, he's what he's saying. He's saying, everything God said you can do, you can do. Everything God said you can have, you can have. And you are who God says that you are. Now, I want to encourage you. I want to look back at two old IDF, Israeli Defense Force soldiers for a moment. The first one I want to introduce you to, his name is Shama. Now, David ends up with 30 mighty men, and then there's three that are on top of the 30. They, they, they are the most outstanding, and Shammah is one of the three, all right? It says that he's a Harite, and the Philistines had gathered together in a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. Now, lentils are like little peas or little beans, all right? So the people fled from the Philistines, but he stationed himself in the middle of the field, defended it, killed the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Now, if you had asked Shammah, he might have thought he did that all on his own, but i got news for you. The Lord was there, all right? You know, fearless men die for their convictions. And if you don't have something in your life that you're willing to die for, you're, you're in a very, very sad position. But think about this. A, a field of beans... The enemy's coming. They're outnumbered. All of his friends, all the other soldiers run, but he stands his ground and puts himself in the middle of a bean field. Now, he is not defending it because of its monetary value. 
right? He's defending it because he is determined that he will not allow the enemy to have one foot of the ground that he has been assigned to protect. He is going to stand his ground against the enemies. You say, but it's just a bunch of beans. But listen to me. If you let the devil have your beans, he's going to want your enchilada, your chimichanga, your torta, your wife, your kids, your job, your money, your ministry. He, you give the devil one inch and he wants a mile. He will not stop. And Shama says, you are not having anything that God has assigned to me. I am standing my ground. It may not seem important to other people. It may seem like a trivial, trivial thing, but it's not a trivial thing. Do you realize the Bible says when you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in, in much. And he starts out here, he's just a regular private grunt soldier. But by the time the day is done, he is promoted to general. Because he was faithful with what God gave him. And it may not have seemed like much to anybody else, but he took it seriously. James 5, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. Dynamic in its working. Now, let me introduce you to one more IDF guy, Israeli Defense Force, 1000 B.C. His name is Benaiah. Right now, my grand, I have a grandson named Benaiah. I, I had pancakes with Benaiah yesterday. We named him after this guy. Right now, this guy, it, it, by the way, if, if uh, you go to uh, the armor school that the United States has today outside, there is a bronze statue of Patton, General Patton. Right. And General Patton said this, pursue the enemy with utmost audacity and do not take counsel of your fears. I think he got it from Beniah. All right. Now here's what the Bible says about Beniah. All right. He's the son of a valiant man from Kabzil who had done many deeds. He killed two lion-like heroes of Moses, Moab. He also had gone down and killed a lion in a pit in, on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff, wrestled the spear of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. These things did Beniah, and he won a name among the three mighty men. Now, the Bible says that he was the son of a valiant man. You can get some physical attributes from your parents, right? But what goes down on the inside of you, that you get by association. Right? It can be an association in your family. It can be an association outside your family. But it is extremely important. You just get the physical stuff from your parents. So the Bible says he pursues a lion into a pit on a snowy day. I would not chase a coyote into a pit on a snowy day. Right? But he chases a lion. That lion, I don't know what that lion was thinking, but it should never have messed with Benaiah's family. Right? Because Benai is like, I'm after you. He did not wait for the enemy to show up. The enemy's running. He takes off after him. He chases him down into a pit on a snowy day alone. All right? Kills that lion. And it becomes part of his resume. I know he wasn't working on his resume that day, but it became part of his resume. And by the way, he became the chief of secret service for David, the chief of his bodyguards. And then under Solomon, he becomes the number one military person in the entire nation. But you know what he did? He pursued the enemy. He pursued the enemy, took no counsel of his fears, and he just went after it and killed that thing. He says, I'm not giving you another chance. Numbers 33, God is speaking to Israel. He says, but if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be that those that you let remain shall be irritants in your eyes, thorns in your side, and they shall harass you in the land where you dwell. So God said to Israel, when you go in, you have to dispossess everybody. Because if you don't, irritants in your eyes, thorns in your side, and they will harass you. And ultimately, they did not do what God said. And those enemies contaminated Israel to the point 
that God ultimately let Israel be dispossessed and go into captivity. So here's what God is saying. You, you realize that promised land is not a type of heaven. When you get to heaven, there's going to be no enemies there. No giants, no walled cities, no iron chariots. It's going to be heaven. But the promised land is a type of victorious Christian life. And if you and I are going to have a victorious Christian life, we need to dispossess every enemy. Jesus said, the evil one comes. He has nothing in me. He said, there is no inroad. I have attacked the enemy and I have pursued him and I have destroyed him on every front. He has no open door, no opportunity in my life. And that's what we need to do. We cannot let the enemy stay in our lives in any area at all. He'll be an irritant, a thorn in your side. He will be constantly pursuing you, agitating you, trying to pull you back into that old life. But just like Beniah, chase him, chase him down, chase him into a pit, kill him and destroy the enemy that is the enemy of your soul. If you're watching today and you're not where you should be with God, let me just say this. The number one thing that God wants for your life is he wants you to be forgiven. He wants you to be right with him. He wants you to receive the forgiveness he has for you. And if you're not right, you're away from God. You say, I need to get back to God. I need to get right with God. Would you bow your head? Pray this prayer out loud from your heart. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe he rose again. I receive him today as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to live for him every day. I thank you. You've heard my prayer that I'm forgiven, that I'm your child on my way to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that simple prayer from your heart, God heard that prayer and you are forgiven and right with God. Now, we want to help you keep growing spiritually. And I've got a book I've written that I want to give you free. You can download it right now. All the information's right there on your screen. If you need a hard copy, we can get you that. It's absolutely free. We want you to keep growing spiritually. And if this program is helping you, if it's blessing you, feeding you spiritually, please become a partner with us. Help us as we're taking the gospel to the nations. We love you. God bless. Would you like someone to begin standing with you in prayer? If so, please do not hesitate to call. Walking by Faith Prayer Partners will be glad to stand with you in prayer. If you would like to purchase today's teaching, we have it available on DVD for $8 and CD for $6. To order, just call or visit walkingbyfaith.tv. Thank you for watching Walking by Faith. Walking by Faith is made possible in part by the generous gifts of our viewers. If you would like to contribute to reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through this program, please contact us at Walking by Faith, 5120 Ivan Rest Avenue Southwest, Granville, Michigan, 49418.